President Biden aims to cut the country's carbon emissions in half by 2030 and have a net zero carbon economy by 2050. To meet those goals, the president is calling for increased investment in renewable energy sources like wind, solar and hydroelectric power. But what about nuclear power as an alternative to fossil fuels? In 2020, nuclear energy accounted for 20 percent of power generated in the United States, the same amount as other renewable sources. But while investments are being made into renewables, many of America's 94 nuclear reactors are nearing the end of their operational life, and few new reactors have been built in recent decades. For more, I'm joined by Jacopo Bongiorno. He is a professor of nuclear science and engineering at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He is also the co-chair of the MIT study, The Future of Nuclear Energy in a Carbon-Constrained World. Jacopo, good to have you here. Your study calls nuclear energy one of the most astonishing, one of the most astonishing scientific and technological achievements of the 20th century. But not everybody has that same sort of passion uh, when it comes to nuclear fuel. And there really hasn't been much innovation or investment in nuclear power in recent decades. What are some of the reasons for that? And what do you think, what do you say to people who hear this and automatically think, Nuclear is scary. We don't want to have anything to do with that. So actually, in the U.S., there has been uh, quite a bit of innovation, but you're correct, not as uh, much investment, certainly not the investment needed to take that innovation to, uh, to market, to commercialize it. Um, on the other end, in other countries, I'm thinking China, Russia, India, uh, South Korea, there has been both significant innovation and adequate investment. Um, I, I think what uh, can change the situation now is the awareness that we are facing a um, challenge of a great magnitude, which is the challenge, obviously, of um, confronting climate change and uh, decarbonizing our economic system, and uh, a, a growing awareness that uh, we need in our toolkit uh, all technologies that are carbon-free or low-carbon and that can scale rapidly. And nuclear certainly has proven in the past that uh, it, meets, it, it meets that goal. So I think, you know, the, the, the situation now is such that there is a, an opportunity, a fresh opportunity for take uh, another look at nuclear. What have been the implications of letting nuclear power seemingly fall by the wayside? And and tell our audience, give them a little bit of context. Uh, there was a big boom in uh, nuclear uh, power construction early on in the last century, and then it all s really stopped. And the few nuclear reactors that are currently under construction are way over budget and way behind schedule. What is going on? Yeah, everything you said is accurate. Uh, I, I would start from the following point. Uh, nuclear currently account for, as you said, 20 percent of our um, electricity supply in the United States. That actually translates to about 50 percent, a little bit over 50 percent of our um, uh, carbon-free electricity. So it already has an outsized uh, contribution to, the, uh, um, to our clean energy infrastructure. However, and we do have in the U.S. the largest uh, the largest fleet of nuclear reactors worldwide. However, as you correctly pointed out, it is a uh, fairly old fleet. Uh, I would say it has been well maintained. Um, a lot of components have been replaced. It has been uh, certainly very well operated. And we have a capable regulator, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, that can review and ensure that it continues to operate reliably and safely. So I would say the first order of business, if we're serious about decarbonizing, is making sure that we don't lose ground. And therefore, we need to ensure that those 90-plus reactors that we currently have continue to operate for the, for the foreseeable future. But if we want to um, aggressively reduce uh, emissions, not only in the power sector, but across all sectors of the economy, then clearly we're going to need more. We're going to need more of all low-carbon energy technologies, not only nuclear, but including nuclear. The value proposition of nuclear is uh, manifold, but let me just mention a couple of things. First, it's very high density, very complex, so it doesn't take nearly as much land as, say, uh, solar or wind farms. Uh, it is also dispatchable or controllable, so you get the energy when you need it. It doesn't add variability on intermittency. That's very important. Uh, and, and number three, it is a heat source. Uh, so there are uh, many applications, I'm thinking, of factories and processes or even heating up buildings, et cetera, that do not require electricity. They actually require heat. And uh, nuclear reactors are heat sources. So I think a combination of 
uh, uh, more nuclear reactors on the power grid, as well as the deployment of nuclear reactors in other sectors of the economy, can be a great contribution to our decarbonization efforts. So you are you're clearly a, a big proponent of nuclear power and see its potential in uh, in being an affordable and um, and and uh, a, a, a more renewable power source in this country. But there are still so many people who don't don't want additional nuclear uh, power plants, particularly when it comes to any place near where they live. What do you say to those folks, and what do you think needs to be done to make nuclear power more affordable, more available, and more acceptable to folks here in the United States? Yeah, all, all great questions. On, on the question of acceptability, I would simply encourage people to reach out to folks that live near the existing nuclear power plants. It's kind of interesting because when you look at sort of the uh, uh, survey uh, uh, about support or opposition to nuclear, uh, there are big spikes in support for nuclear near the existing nuclear power plants. These are folks that have been living with the technology for many decades. Uh, they either work at the plant or they have a neighbor that, that works at the plant, and they are they are comfortable with it to see that it's benign and it has a lot of a lot of benefits. Um, on the question of affordability, that's a tougher nut to crack, and, and I think the implication of your question is, is accurate. If nuclear does not become more affordable in the United States, uh, it will not grow. And so part of the study that, that you mentioned at the beginning that we conducted here at MIT was uh, focused on understanding how you reduce the cost of new nuclear power plants. And when you build a new nuclear power plant, the cost of nuclear energy that that plant produces uh, is uh, greatly affected by the cost of the plant itself. Nuclear fuel doesn't cost much. Operating the plants doesn't cost much. It's really the cost of the construction of the plant. And so I think the industry in the U.S. has started to think in, 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 in the right direction here and um, uh, moving away from very, very large nuclear power plants of the past, which require sprawling construction sites with thousands of workers. Those projects are very complex to manage and to execute on time and on budget, and move more towards smaller machines, smaller reactors that can be more serially manufactured, particularly in factories, which are very efficient, high productivity environments. Uh, the additional benefit of having smaller reactors is that the overall financial risk associated with it is lower, because the capital that has to be invested up front is, is a lot smaller. So I think that's the way to make it happen. Uh, there is even an extreme um, uh, example, if you wish, of this miniaturization of, of nuclear reactors. It's what people refer to as uh, micro reactors or nuclear batteries. And now they are so small that not only can be made in factories the same way that you would make a jet engines or some other machines, but they can actually be transported in one piece. They're portable reactors and they can be deployed everywhere, mm -hmm. say in a factory or a desalination plant or a military base, etc. So the innovations are, are, are real and they are. And they're here in the United States, but the investment has been lacking, to your earlier point. And so now it's the time to make that investment if we want to have this tool, this additional tool in our toolkit to combat climate change. Interesting to see how that will play out as President Biden tries to meet his goal of cutting uh, carbon emissions in this country. Jacopo Bongiorno, thank you. My pleasure.